You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 78, part two. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into this world. Hey, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna. I'm the host of the Artist Athlete Podcast, and I'm the founder of theartistathlete.com. Before I get any further, I just want to give you a heads up. If this is the first time you're tuning into the podcast, welcome. It's so awesome that you found us here, us, me, <laughs> sitting in my room all alone. But it's a bigger, it, it's an us. It, there's, there's, there's more than just me involved. It's, it's an us. This is not a great episode for you to start on because it's part two of my interview. Part one happened last week. So what I would do, if I would start with last week's episode, 78 part one, and then come back and listen to this week's episode because I pick up right in the middle of my interview with Gypsy Snyder and you'll just miss a lot. To everyone else, welcome back. Special shout out as always to my Patreons. Patreon.com slash the artist athlete is the way you can become a Patreon. And I've seen a lot of people create Patreons these days as the pandemic has persisted and a lot of artists are taking online, which I think is amazing. People use their Patreon in a lot of different ways. Some people offer a ton of content. I actually have built my Patreon kind of on the basis that like National Public Radio does their fundraising in that I offer my podcast for free to everyone, whether you pay for it or not. And I do that because I want this to be accessible to everyone, anywhere. When I was a 21, 22-year-old trying to figure out how to become a circus artist, I certainly could not have afforded even the dollar a month. I was on food stamps at the time. I, there was no way I could have let go of the $12 I needed every penny to help fund a project like this. And I look back on that person and I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Don't become a Patreon. Save you pennies. But if you are in a position where you can throw a dollar, five dollars a month my direction to help this be free for everyone else, that's what my Patreon is for. So yes, if you give five dollars a month or more, you get a sticker. You get an advanced listen to the podcast. They come out on Sundays instead of Mondays. And if you give $30, you can call up and we can have a little chat. But aside from that, there's not much more going on the Patreon. Sometimes I'll leave little notes and say hi. I'm really proud that it has grown the way it has, even though I haven't really offered a lot on it. It's a testament to how community-minded y'all are, my patrons, who are really thinking not about me or not about themselves and what they can offer themselves, but what we can contribute as a community, back to the community. So shout out to my patrons, patreons, patrons, pa whatever. Shout out to you guys. Y'all are great. Shout out to everyone who can't afford to be a patron. <laughs> I need to pick a word. Shout out to everybody who can't afford to be a Patreon right now because of whatever condition you're in. Listen to this. Enjoy this. Find hope from this. The circus is going to continue, guys. It's going to happen. We just got to chop wood, carry water, keep going. My guest today is Gypsy Snyder, as it was last week. If you don't know who she is, you want a review on her bio. She's the a co-founder, artistic director of The Seven Fingers. That's all I want to say about it. I just want to get into the interview. But I do want to say before we start, the recording date of this interview was April 18th. And that's important to note because there's one question that I ask Gypsy where I say, how are you doing with all of this? 
And it's not very specific what I'm talking about, but I am referencing the global pandemic, which at that point in Montreal, where Gypsy and I are, stay in place orders had been in effect for probably three weeks at that point, I want to say. So we didn't know everything we know now about the virus. Also, the conversation that has needed to be had for a very long time about race in America, which could be translated to race in Canada or anywhere in the Western world as well, needs to be had. And it's very interesting to think what kind of conversation Gypsy and I could have had uh, if we had had this conversation last week as opposed to two months ago. Here's part two of my interview with Gypsy Snyder. I love your point, though, about how mastery of a certain discipline not only gives you mastery over that discipline, but kind of has the added bonus or the necessary effect of giving you the ability to kind of push through or hit walls and then figure out how to climb over them or dig under them or however you get through that. Yeah, um, I, I, it's something that I definitely try and instill in, for example, my children is it's really easy to start something, have fun with it, and then move on and sort of say, oh, I've got this. But for me, anything you do needs to be transformative. And to be able to create a, a creative transformative experience, you need to have transformed yourself. And that's a big misconception, I think, in the art world for a lot of people who sort of say, oh, this is fun, or I like doing this, but don't really understand the responsibility that comes with being a performer or an artist, where you're actually, when someone pays to see a show, in the end, it's not necessarily just to be entertained. Ideally, art is opening a part of our minds or our hearts to a better understanding of the world or who we are or relationships or connectivity. Um, and that's the responsibility of the performer. Uh, and I'm, that can be in contemporary circus, that can be in traditional circus, that can be in any form of, there's a responsibility and a generosity that I believe is required in performance. And it's, it's basically the only requirement uh, to be mm. able to master what you're doing enough to be able to give it generously and responsibility to the audience. Do you feel like you've had these kinds of walls or transformations in your directing career? Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say pretty much every production I've ever done has had a huge impact on myself as a, as a human but as well as my, uh, as an artist or as a director, I, d I don't really ever, I, I think the curious element uh, in that I would require from anyone because I require it from myself is the transformation or the transformative process. So that entails doing something to the extent that it affects you in a surprising way that takes you someplace unexpected. You know, if I'm directing a show and it's not stimulating me, it's not if what I'm seeing on the stage or the costumes or the music or whatever, if it's, if it's stays in a safe sort of like, Oh, that's good. I'm completely unstimulated. So mm. if, as soon as I'm saying, Oh, that's good. And I feel done, then I need to find some other aspect of the work that's going to take me further. And that hunger is really difficult to explain. It's, it's very difficult for people who, that I'm working with because there's never a feeling of, of satisfaction, <laughs> which is true and not true. I mean, I obviously have so much fun in the work. And when I see something that's amazing, I'm the first to just be up and screaming and clapping and like, Oh my God, I can't believe that's so good. And it, and, and I think as a director, you know, people watching me direct, and I've seen Shana actually have this too of like, ah, I love that so much. Um, I think that pleasure that I'm able to take from what 
the work is becoming is because the work isn't me and the work isn't necessarily the performer. It's this other thing that happens that I absolutely allow myself to be tickled by. That said, I don't go, good, done, finished, move on. I, I, even the things that I choose to say, okay, that's in a good place and we've achieved something here. Great. That allows me to work on some other aspect of the work and take it further always. I mean, years into the show, like, you know, 10 years of touring traces, still giving notes every time, still changing music, still changing costume. Um, just yeah it and not because i'm not not because i'm not satisfied but because there's oh i'm evolving you're evolving the show is evolving the audience is evolving the world is evolving so that it i it kind of reminds me of this quote it's i'm gonna butcher it but it's something like the painter is never finished painting he just stops at an interesting place right exactly something like this oh yeah and Um, i I think i couldn't be a painter for that very reason (laughs) Mm. I mean, and I know that a painter then goes and paints something else. It would be, I would be one of those painters that would be very difficult for me to go back and look at one of the old paintings. And in fact, watching one of my old shows is also difficult. One, because I don't enjoy watching shows on video, but if I can't get my hands in on it and excited about it and moving forward with it, then it, it's sort of in the past. Do you struggle at all with perfectionism? Uh, Before we got on this call, I was listening to this talk with Oprah, who was talking about the difference between perfectionism and striving for excellence. Mm-hmm. And so it just makes me think, like, if you, if you do struggle with it, and then how do you modulate it so that you can continue to live in kind of an inspired place? Yeah, I don't have a problem with perfectionism. Because, Work. Love that. Because I don't really believe in it. Hmm. I'm more interested in the imperfect. For me, any kind of storytelling that we're doing really has to do with, yeah, the imperfection of the human is what makes me fall in love with them. The faults, the, again, the pathos or the, yeah, I, I'm the, the quirkiness, the um, anything that is sort of not perfect is what interests me. Now, of course, Mm. I do like the idea of achieving something excellent, but not perfect. And in fact, if you notice in any Seven Fingers show, you know, you'll see someone do some incredibly beautiful piece of work, and then we try and break them down to being just a person that you could relate to. It could be you, it could be your cousin, we're really trying to show the vulnerability of our performers, the vulnerability of their characters and their situations so that they're relatable. I'm not interested in any way in showing a perfect person on stage with a perfect body doing perfect tricks and perfect lines. I mean, that's uh, Cirque du Soleil does it beautifully. And in fact, I, I would even say in the heyday of Cirque du Soleil, the thing that that Franco really was able to achieve was you've got these perfect acrobats with these perfect bodies doing these perfect tricks, but the whole pageant around it was always deforming the bodies, always finding Mm. a a darker side to the visual soul and bestiality of the, of our humanity, which then got transformed over time in their recipe of like, Oh, we're little weird creatures or we have to have, masks or we're lizards or we're not, you know, whatever. But in the, in the era of Franco Dragon, I think what he was trying to do was create images that made the circus that gave it two sides, a a dark and a light side. And that was what was so appealing in those shows, especially Kidam, obviously. But, and I remember that that was the thing that I was attracted to. And in fact, now art for me, I need to see the darkness and the imperfection and the humanity for it to touch me. And if I don't see it, if I don't feel it, I'm not touched. And then I unfortunately don't care. I guess this is what you would define as the dark side of storytelling. Can you explain that a little? Do you mean negative emotions on stage (laughs) or like tragedy? I I do. 
it's, you could boil it down to negative emotions. You could boil it down to tragedy. You could boil it down to just pure tension. I mean, any story, mm. any story is writ- has to have a beginning. And, you know, in a musical, it's like the I want song. I want something. And then the character can't have it. And it's his struggle to get it. And then the resolution is achieving it. So that is very important important to me to feel even in our shows that don't necessarily have a narrative of, you know, the beginning, well, we always have a beginning, middle and an end, but we don't have a concrete, I want story, or we don't have a, a concrete Romeo and Juliet story necessarily. Say if you're talking about passager or traces or reversible, I still have a structure of propose a situation, achieve a a deeper understanding of the conflict within that situation. And then ideally some kind of resolution at the end and that you will feel in a seven finger show very predominantly. Uh, Mm. That structure is absolutely there. And I'm not saying that the tension necessarily happens in the middle or only in the middle, but we're constantly playing with that. And there are feelings of aggression, uh, perhaps grief or sorrow, uh, intellectual f- frustration, which can be more funny, you can you can find that in every single piece that we're talking about. And no, it's not just because we want to have oh a sad song here or the girl on the tissue should be super emoting. That the emotion has to absolutely come from a very concrete image that we're trying to evoke. You know, in Reversible, every single scene was based on a transitory m- or a trans formative moment in the lives of the grandparents of each of the artists. I did, you know, like about eight months before creation interviews with the artists who then had to do interviews with their families and then would come back with the results of their research. And then I took images and recreated vignettes or scenes based on that image. So for example, there's this one grandmother who was born in Japan and was in a prearranged marriage and decided, met this Swiss guy who was on a judo competition tour in the late fifties, early sixties. They met, they couldn't even speak. She spoke Japanese. He spoke English and, and French. And she decides in the middle of the night to pack up and leave her family and go to Switzerland with this guy. And it it was just one of the most touching stories And so I just built a room in which this woman is contemplating leaving her family to run off with this person that she can't even communicate with. And it was a silks act. And then on the other side of the stage in another room was a woman who was enacting her grandmother who lived in a tiny village in France and was sort of the star, like fierce, beautiful French woman of the town who found out she had cancer, breast cancer, and knew she was going to die because at the time there was no therapies or anything to do for cancer. Um, Mm -hmm. And so she's about to leave. And the rope was her symbology to knowing that she was leaving and then on the other side was the silks which was this woman who was escaping her family and her life and it, they were living these parallel lives and it was just so beautiful and so full of intensity and drama and you felt a sadness and a liberation in both of these characters that I'm sure the audience didn't know those backstories at all I mean they had no idea what we were talking about necessarily but it was real And Mm. very often I see people going like, I'm going to take a sad music and I'm going to do an act because I love this song and I love being intense and dramatic on the, on the silks. And, and that's what it's going to be. And I mean, I'm, 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 that sounds very negative and I don't mean to be frivolous. I think most people who want to uh, emote on stage have a reason, but I don't know that they necessarily have the tools to connect the emotion with the imagery which is basically Mm. all I'm interested in doing is connecting each movement on the silks or on the floor or in my relationship to the object or the discipline is based on an image in that story. What it seems to be looking at your work, and I don't know if this is a a correct evaluation or not, but it it seems like there's less interest 
less interest in the literal story and more on that emotion and imagery? Actually, my interest is more on the story and making sure that what people are feeling when they see it is relative to that. The, the thing is, is that the circus in and of itself abstracts my story. And mm. my goal is to make sure that that abstraction is anchored in something very, very real that the audience can then feel and also interpret from their standpoint. How much work do you do with emotions with your performers? I do a lot of emotional work. I am a very emotional person. Uh, I think Shana is the same. And I would even say that for other fingers in different ways. I learned sort of through my years also in acting school, you know, how to differentiate therapy from work. And when you're able to identify and very clearly differentiate and love human fallacy and human emotion, you can really create a space within which you can explore these emotions without it like just being a downer (laughs) or without it really, or without it like fucking with your head. And that is so key. I definitely want to have the most healthy, joyful, full of life experience. Like my whole goal in life is to live life deeper and stronger and with more joy and love as humanly possible. I just, for me, these emotions are part of that 100% and really identify Mm -hmm. them as such that it's far less scary and difficult to go there. So I try and create a, a workspace where they're absolutely welcome and the emotions are absolutely respected, but they are also work and require a, a very strong discipline to be able to go there and continue working. I mean, obviously there have been moments where we we've, we've had to stop, but then I don't either then turn this whole thing into a therapy session. I think, and I think I'm able to do that because I've set up an infrastructure within the work that is so clear and defined and safe and that the understanding is to achieve a deeper level in the work that it, it so far has not backfired or I haven't, or I haven't felt that anyone's been in real danger or, or felt unhealthy within any, any of those situations. Definitely crying sessions, definitely sessions where people are doing what they need to do on stage and just sobbing through it. Sometimes they have to stop. Sometimes they Mm. don't. Um, I've definitely cried through rehearsals and performances as a director and a performer, but never stopped working. Mm. And that for me is the key. I would say even in my darkest, most darkest personal moments in my life, I remember feeling a very deep, but strong light that says to me, this is part of being human and this is beautiful and it's going to take me somewhere incredible. That's so brave. <laughs> um, that's the that's the only word I can think of to like yeah. <laughs> everything you're describing. Like, I'm sorry. I'm, that's that very it, brave. It's, I'm very um, I have no other question about that. <laughs> I'm very just, flattered. Just a comment. And I'm, that's a wonderful <laughs> word to hear. And I definitely think that art is a risky, it's a, it's a, all about taking risks and to, to take risks, you absolutely have to be brave. But I will tell you as a cancer survivor and as someone who had a terrible car accident, two terrible car accidents in my life, y- bravery is something that we all need to spend a little bit of time with. And it's maybe not necessarily what we think it is. And I think a lot of people call on bravery when they they say, well, I'll, I'll be brave when I need to be brave. But in many emotional situations on our day-to-day lives, we tend to turn away from situations or feelings um, that maybe could be taking us further if we went through them, not necessarily dwelled in them, but what took the time and the courage to go through them. And I would actually say it's an emotional intelligence that will, if if it was a muscle that you needed to exercise, it will absolutely give you a beautiful strength later in life for 
some of the difficult situations that we will all face at one point or another. Speaking of difficult situations, I, I just can't help but bring it up, even though I'm tired of reading the newspaper and I'm tired of, my parents are actually in Atlanta, Georgia, and Georgia is one of the states where they've decided to reopen everything all of a sudden. Um, but that's not my question at all. <laughs> my, my question is, in these times, what are you doing? How are you doing? Gypsy, yes, is it going to be okay? Like, what are your thoughts? Is it going to be okay? Yes, Just hold I'm me. Is it gonna be okay? I, I absolutely think it's going to be okay. I even think it's going to be amazing and beautiful and titillating mm -hmm. and exciting. But I also go through moments of, will I ever create work again? Will I ever have work in this thing that I've dedicated my entire life to? Will I lose my home? What will my children do? I mean, all those things that we're all feeling, I feel. And I come from a place, a, absolutely a place of privilege in this moment because I've worked up to a certain space. I have a home and I have two healthy children. And I have two healthy parents who both have homes. So I feel uh, even with the company that, you know, had the rug completely pulled out from under it, there's a very strong infrastructure that I have managed to build around myself or has built, built, you know, with this group of friends and colleagues and family that happens to be right now very strong. So I, my, my ability to see the positivity is a little bit coming from a place of privilege. However, I actually do take time to really exercise the thoughts of well, what if this is not so great? What if this, what are the, what are the worst case scenarios? What would my other career be? What do I need to do politically? And I'll tell you the way that I get through it. <laughs> there is Please. the, I have a little checklist and it's funny. I saw someone with a little checklist posted on Facebook uh, or Instagram or something a while, a couple days ago. My checklist doesn't quite look the same, but you know, it's like step outside and you know, be in fresh air, cook something healthy. I have clean something that's like cleaning or organizing my house. And it's going to be five minutes, 10 minutes. And I'm just checking these things off the list, getting my heart rate up, check it off the list and doing something for the environment is not on their list, but I have it and it can be composting mm. or, you know, I'm growing all I'm seeding all these like herbs and, and potted vegetable like radishes. I mean, I don't have a garden, but um, just seeding things that I know that we could cook with um, or flowers that will make us happy. Composting, political. I have a little like political thing, <laughs> a little to check off on the list. And so it can be, I bought stamps the other day and sent them to my nephew. So he, during his homeschooling, could write a letter to me and practice his writing. But I really want to promote the, the U.S. Postal Service right now at a time where I really hope we're going to be able to mm. um, do postal voting, if that's something that's going to be uh, in the future. It can be mm. calmly reading an article that I trust about politics or about the environment. Uh, it can be sharing that with other people. I'm not a huge political poster online. I don't like to post commentary, but I did, for example, post you know, I just a picture of the U.S. Postal Service so you could like them on Facebook, you know, just somehow, yeah, little gestures uh, for the environment, little gestures for politics every day. I also do obviously reach out to my parents more regularly than before, but I'm trying once a week to reach out to someone that might be a little bit lonely or that might be struggling and to just make myself feel strong for them or commiserate with them so that we feel that we're both together. So I, I've been trying to at least once a week contact someone that, and every single time I guarantee you, they go, gypsy, you're calling me. And, um, <laughs> you know, just really try to find someone that I wouldn't normally call and, and, and take the time to just sit and have a conversation with them. Um, is really important. And then obviously I also have 
a check off um, something for my work that is creative, something for my work that is a potential would maybe potentially structure our company in such a way that could get it out of this very difficult situation. So I just, Hmm. you know, I don't spend, I I just try and have that checklist and I don't even get necessarily to everything every day. Some of the things are a little bit more weekly and whatever, but it really, really, really helps me realize that there are a lot of things that need our attention right now beyond COVID and, and just, yeah, just doing them every day because we have the time to do them really could spark you know, if you put it out there in the universe, I feel like I put this thing out there in the universe for the post office. And now it's like, I'm so convinced they're going to be saved and we're going to be able to have voter, you know, ballots uh, through the postal system. Um, and it, and it gives me joy. It gives me joy to see, uh, other people getting on board with it. I do want to continue this interview, but I also want to respect your time because we are at about an hour. Um, um, I, I would have, let's see. Uh, I would have like 20 more minutes and then I got to stop for a second before I get on to the next thing. Okay, great. Um, uh, okay. I, all right. How do I structure my time? I want to ask you, because this is kind of a perfect segue into, um, the last point that you suggested in your email, which was the artist as a political figure or maybe not activist, but maybe, uh, how do you see what you created or what you are creating as a director in the greater political structure of we'll say the well, world two things from my perspective and my work i am deeply deeply committed to presenting through the work diverging ideas or people or backgrounds or cultures um coexisting i would say that's like kind of like first and foremost i remember it as a kid thinking, wow, the circus is just this perfect ecosystem and exemplary. Like if, if the world could be run like a circus where everyone is accepted from all kinds of different religious beliefs and political beliefs and heritages and backgrounds, you know, even in traditional circus, you know, we had a Moroccan acrobat who had to stop working every day for prayer And, you know, couldn't eat pork or, you know, all the, all the things around his culture that was just so fascinating to me. And then you had the born again Christians who had the whole completely different set of beliefs in traditional circus. There's quite a few of them from to the total like hippie style, burning man styles performers, and they're all working together. And the show is the most important thing. And the show for me represented sort of society and creating something together that functions and brings joy and health and happiness. So diverging ideas and cultures and people working together in a very sort of codependent, putting their lives in each other's hands is sort of the first message before we get into whatever the theme of the actual show is that we're talking about. So reversible um, for me was right around the last election period, and I was feeling incredibly destabilized. It was sort of the beginning of a discussion that I felt was happening in culture about our roots and how I think we really started looking to the past to see how we were going to continue into the future. I based the whole show on sort of this homage to our grandparents because I felt like in doing all the research we were doing on the grandparents, you start to realize, okay, one, they've lived through way more difficult situations than we have in my lifetime up until now, including now, you know, world wars and genocides of cultures and beliefs, which to actually to this day still continue. However, they really lived it directly and the strength that they got through and had mm-hmm. children that are now like circus performers and sort of living our best lives really sort of grounded the work for the performers and for myself and in the storytelling. But it also for me did this incredible thing that slowed down time, which seems to be moving quicker and quicker these days, especially with the internet, where I could sort of say, okay, only two generations ago, this is where we 
were, and that's not that far away. And look at the evolution Mm. and that we've had since that time. And this is what I can now achieve in the future as a continuum of that work. So reversible was really dedicated to that. And for me, I very much got the feeling that people left the show feeling deeply grounded and feeling this sort of connection to the past as a tool for the future, which was really the goal. After that, I think, I don't think our work has always been that political. I think some of the pieces we've done have been more political or less political. The last piece I created was really based on gender identity and my deep, deep belief that gender is absolutely a fluid concept and that love is love and that how you choose to express yourself creatively or not or very generically is based on the strength that you have to love yourself as who you are and give your love to someone else. So the whole show is based on that. I love that. I I was listening to this interview with a a futurologist. One of my favorite podcasts right now is called Ologies. And it's all of these experts from all of these different fields. And they interviewed a futurologist who was talking about how the greatest innovations in the past few decades have not been, I mean, there have been obviously great strides in technology and manufacturing and communication and all these things, but the greatest has been shifts sociologically in the way we treat people and the way we think about gender and these kinds of things. And it's come from kind of the explosion in culture that we've had Mm -hmm. from artists. Yeah, absolutely. It is really cool. I would love to listen to that. I'm, I definitely, you know, people often ask if you had a superpower, what would it be? And mine would absolutely be time travel. 100%. Oh, cool. And um, not flying. I no interest in flying or being invisible. (laughs) (laughs) Not, yeah, time travel. That's a good one. It is a really good one. And I really think it it gives you sort of just incredible perspective. So I'd be very curious to listen to the futurologist. Yeah. I'll send you the episode. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. And I mean, gender identity has obviously exploded in the last couple of years. I was really hoping with this piece, or I am hoping with this piece as it plays the world, that it also becomes less about needing to belong to a club. And this is not, um, I'm not in any way negating groups of people, but I'm hoping where we're heading is that less and less we'll need to identify as gay in terms of the gay culture, but more Mm. this is the person that I love and I choose to spend my life with. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the trans community now is it's just it's opening up so many incredibly beautiful questions about who we are and how we physiologically recognize ourselves, but also the whole dysphoria of the mind and the body is very, very exciting. And it's because we are morphing, there is clearly far less a need to pro- procreate got probably way too many people on the planet. And that's probably the main reason we have environmental issues or one of the larger reasons we have environmental issues. So now that we've taken marriage and procreation kind of off the table as main goals of survival in quotations, I think you know, the new survival is really going to have to do with our relationship to nature and to each other. And that really huh. excites me. That really excites me. I want to transition. And actually, um, this talk about gender is kind of a great transition to do so. I did crowdsource some questions for you from Instagram. So we'll do kind of a lightning round. Ooh. And of course, in this lightning round, there are all questions that like require a lot of thought and attention to their <laughs> the answer because they're really great. And that's the way life works. Um, someone asked, going along the idea of gender and um she asked for tips for advancing in production and direction where people often assume a man would be quote unquote better. Uh Have you experienced any kind of 
discrimination sounds so harsh, but I think it can sometimes be a reality discrimination because you're a female kind of operating as a director, which is historically seen as a more male role in entertainment. No, but that's great. I have. <laughs> Uh, it's also because I'm very strong-willed, and I think that I have a certain um, level of testosterone or something that allows me to push through. However, and this is the first time I've ever said this potentially out loud ever, I have witnessed more uh, discrimination that I would call maybe sexism. I don't adhere to spending time on my physical beauty. And as a woman, I've more felt from men in this business or people who assume that you are going to, or people who would expect someone to make art as being physically appealing as a woman. And that I feel that I have this constantly had to prove my intelligence and my creativity because at first look, I'm not selling that. And I have always just not really taken an interest in my own physical beauty or dressing a certain way or having being super fashionable and stylish and getting the tats and the earrings and the, that's just I, I wake up in the morning and I'm moving forward. I'm not doing all this thing, all these things that I sort of feel other men and women and LGBTQ people in the arts very much wear their art on their bodies. So I more would have to say that I don't sell myself physically. And I felt that as a woman, that has been negative. Whereas for men in my positions, they can just come in looking like a slob, being overweight, whatever it is. And it's, there's kind of like, we're going to follow that person. But if a woman doesn't look a certain way or dress a certain way, there's this, I just feel like there's much, a, a much larger hurdle. Whereas I've spent all that time that I could have been in front of the mirror or shopping or doing my hair, I've spent it working. That for me has been an, you know, I, I just constantly feel like I have to p get past that before I can actually like just get down to the work or be seen that way. That feels like such a double edged sword because I do, uh, this just comes to mind, uh, like women who spend a lot of time on their appearance are often criticized for that. Yeah, absolutely. It is. No. A <laughs> I mean, you know, and I, I think, you know, women, are, I think everyone is deals with be more this, be less that. I think, you know, th that finding your own strength of character and just owning who you are. I've just noticed recently that if we're going to really take the time to also say, be who you are, be own your, your gender and your gender identity. I think it's also important to not to, to also understand that capitalism has definitely overexposed us as, as well as the internet has overexposed us to hyper imagery, a sort of a visual world that can very much hide what's actually happening and what's actually happening on the inside. It's something that sort of fascinates me because of course in the entertainment industry, it is very important to catch the eye, to pull people in. It's a visual world. I mean, I love art, just pure. I love color. I love art. I love form. I love shape. I want to celebrate that. It, I don't necessarily want to celebrate it with myself. And I don't want that to be like a requirement to success. So I'm not quite sure that I answered the question. I don't necessarily feel as a woman that I have been discriminated against but I definitely had to put my pants on. And I think maybe that's also affected the way that I look and dress of just like, I'm here for me, like I'm here for the work, not for the rest. So it's kind of, like you said, a double-edged sword. I, and I, I'd, I'd also just like to add very, very quickly, you know, people in circus are in general, 
and you could say this in dance and probably in theater too, so beautiful. I know. Isn't it ridiculous? It's ridiculous. And it's really difficult oh. to really make sure that we're casting and working with people who are have diverse body types and just diverse skin and eyes and mouths and hair and lips, like just, and also just not going for people that you'd necessarily see on a billboard. That's, that's really important for me. Okay. So I had one overwhelming question Mm -hmm. and then I have my last question, which I always ask all of my guests at the end of the show. And actually I feel like somehow they can be one and the same Mm -hmm. because the question that I got from like maybe six or seven people was how do I get into the seven fingers or some iteration of that? Can you pass along my resume to gypsies? You know, all of these things. And then my final question is always, what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? Mm -hmm. And I got this question, the question of, can you give my resume to gypsy from a lot of young artists Mm -hmm. who I think are looking for, ways to make it either as a director, as a performer in the circus industry. Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice for little gypsy or any other little person out there who wants to grow up and be you? Well, for working for the seven fingers, I literally don't have any advice. And it's (laughs) Um, it's a it's a very difficult it's a very difficult thing to say because we don't cast like normal people (laughs) we're always Mm. just like by the seat of our pants meet a person through a person see a show through a thing you know, we had this bias for San Franciscans for years, like anyone who had trained with Lu Yi, we considered our offspring for the longest time. That's a San Francisco reference. And then of course, there's a certain relationship and understanding with the National Circus School, just because most of the fingers went to the National Circus School, and we've all either taught or directed there. And so you just sort of get to know them. But now we're really trying to also be open to We're loving a lot of artists who've maybe now entered the contemporary circus world, but who come from Zip Zap Circus or fruit, you know, the fruit flies in uh, Australia or from Smirkus, um, like real sort of like hardcore traditional circus youth programs. There's there because there's just that real essence of like deep love for the art form and then an evolution into the artist that is really fun and interesting and just also really like appreciates like the get in the mud kind of like make it happen kind of person. So there's really no rhyme or reason to how we cast. We do have a casting platform that is sort of like you can sign up and you can download videos and pictures. And then ideally you write a little note that sort of explains a little bit who you are, where you're coming from, or why you're interested in the seven fingers. And that's very helpful to us. And then this is just going to, it's going to, I'm going to feel so gross saying it, but following us on social media, but also interacting with those platforms, because we're very sort of active of seeing who's commenting, who's asking questions, um, who's tagging us. Like it's really, it's actually, it, it's a great way for us to, to meet people or find like the connections through people because we do, you know, we've worked with people that we didn't know at all. And then we've, but I would say mostly it's through a sort of, again, a word I hate, a network of friends in this culture that um, we love and that the family sort of becomes extended family. As for what I would say to Little Gypsy, when I was growing up, circus was not cool. I was definitely felt like an outcast and weird. And my name was Gypsy. And even though it was the 70s in San Francisco, I wished my name was Sally. I And it took me a really, really long time to understand that the outcast part of who I was was actually the best part of who I was for a long time. I thought it was, I was very judgmental of, um, yeah, just judging things that didn't fit in. And now I think it's all about celebrating the things that don't fit in and creating structure 
for them to then blossom and be functional and forward moving. So that's pretty much my only advice to little Gypsy. I'm so glad I didn't change my name to Sally. Yeah, Gypsy is way cooler. And Sally Snyder sounds like you sell pretzels. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but you know, it was it was real. And that's what's what's so funny to me now is all these people that want to do circus or so many women who've like taken on the name Gypsy as performers. I'm kind of like, I'm mm. so crazy to me that up until like I was 20, I was like, God, I just want to be normal. <laughs> <laughs> just want to be Sally Snyder. Well, I just, I think what it was is I, I, I didn't want, it was just every time I said my name, it started a conversation that I didn't necessarily want to have with just everyone. You know, how did you get that name? What, you know, I just wanted to like go under the radar and that name didn't really help me to do that. And now it still is difficult because sometimes you just want to kind of do the things that you have to do without making them into something. No, it makes sense. It's why sometimes I tell people I'm a PE teacher instead of a circus yeah, artist. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I get absolutely. it. When you're sitting next to someone on an airplane. So did that answer both of the questions or was there one more? That answered the questions. All of the answers to all of the questions were fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on. I really appreciate it. Nice to meet you. I'm sorry we didn't get to see face to FaceTime, but I'm sure that will happen. One day, point. for sure. That was my interview with Gypsy Snyder. And before I give my final thoughts, I just want to say that it was a total thrill to interview Gypsy. I didn't even know she knew who I was. Um, she's one of these figureheads in contemporary circus the Seven Fingers is a very well-known company if you're in the know of circus. And it was a big honor for me as a little podcaster to get such an amazing guest. Not that all my guests aren't amazing, but this one to me felt like a like a win, you know? And despite that, it was so lovely to talk to Gypsy and realize that she's humble and down to earth and still learning and still grappling and trying to understand what the hell is going on, just like the rest of us are. And I think what makes her so special is that she really leans into that grappling. In the interview, she talks about how important it is that every process she goes through creatively is in some way transformative, not just for the audience, but for the performers and even for herself. That to create something, whether that's something on stage or to create your way in the world to create a life, Gypsy says has to be somehow transformative to you. She says in the interview that her goal in life is to feel and connect and to experience the world more deeply and find ways to really confront the tragedies and the questions of the world and through grappling with them, be transformed. I have written down here and she talks about how the work has nothing to do with her. It has nothing to do with the performers. It's this other thing that is created when this collaboration in the studio and on stage and ongoing starts to happen. And I love this idea that the creative work lives outside of any one person or any one form or any one company. It's this kind of amorphous thing that we're always trying to chase down and it has as much of an impact on us as creators as we do on it when we are creating. I feel like that's like super woo woo and heavy, but I hope you guys are you're still with me here. And then the other really interesting point that Gypsy brought up or phrase that she said that kept it keeps echoing in my mind even now. She said, capitalism has overexposed us, as well as the internet, to a visual world that can very much hide what's actually happening. And I don't want to say what she means by that because it, uh, this is my interpretation of what she said, but what it makes me think of is 
the idea of capitalism and entertainment, that the people who want to sell and make the most money and commodify art pick these very easy ways of creating things that are very easily digestible. So I'm thinking of like super traditional, whitewashed, tall, leggy, thin, blonde women, um, you know, heteronormative performances. I'm thinking of very, I want to say typical or ordinary or the expected, that the reason that that exists the way that it does and is so popular is because it's easily commodified. It's easily capitalized on. It's easily packaged and sold. But you know what it isn't? It's not transformative. It keeps things kind of the same. The same old tropes, the same old love stories, the same old body types and shapes And I think what's exciting right now, as this pandemic has kind of caused us, everyone in the circus industry, to hit the pause button and take a step back and look at the industry, it's made us examine all of this and talk about all this and reflect on it in a way that we weren't when we were just trying to get the next contract or book the next gig. And I'm really excited to see what comes out of all of these reflections. I'm really excited to see the type of artists who emerge and the ways in which they find to create the work they want to create. If you want to see more of Gypsy's company, The Seven Fingers, they're online, thesevenfingers.com, and on Instagram, at The Seven Fingers. Gypsy may feel gross about talking about social media, but I don't give a fuck. I love social media. That's how my bills get paid. So follow me on Instagram, At the underscore artist underscore athlete, I post aerial training tips and inspiration. I'm also on Facebook, The Artist Athlete. My website is theartistathlete.com. And the place to go to contribute to this wonderful little project called The Artist Athlete Podcast is patreon.com slash theartistathlete. Thanks for tuning in, friends, fans, and enemies. Talk at you next week. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hi, everyone. This is Allie Cooper, owner and coach at the Radical Movement Factory in Santa Cruz, California. I love supporting the Artist Athlete Podcast and the amazing community Shannon has created here. I teach rope and fabric and have a circus conditioning app available on iTunes called Cirque Plus. You can follow me on Instagram at AllieCooper underscore. And if you find yourself in California, come say hi. Hi, I'm Leah. I hate conditioning. So I created the ABCs of Fitness, a fun, full program of active flexibility, body weight, and cardio with personal daily check-ins to motivate you wherever you are and whatever discipline you do. Join our next 19-day check-in challenge and slide into my DMs on Instagram at ABCs of Fitness. Aloha, my name is Beth Russell and I live on the beautiful island of Maui, Hawaii. I am an aerial artist and movement instructor specializing in chakra yoga to keep me balanced and grounded. I play with silks, trapeze, lira, rope, acro, aerial yoga and dance, slack lining, pole, bungee and climbing. Really anything that goes up and allows me to explore 3D space. You can find my dedicated aerial page on Instagram at Maui Aerialist. If you find yourself coming to Maui, let's play. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. So if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and slings and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And um, that's why I'm Patreon. Hello all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the city, 
feel free to stop by the aviary in Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and goodbye. Hey there, artists and athletes. This is Andy Smith, owner and artistic director at Saltaire Circus School in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. And I want to thank you for contributing to the Artist Athlete Podcast. If you ever find yourself down in Florida, come check us out. Whether you're an artist, athlete, or someone ordinary just looking to be extraordinary, we have a place for you.